Thank you very much. And thank you, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, I've always been a great fan of Sweden. When I was very young, I had a Swedish girlfriend, and since then, I just love the country. These, uh, these days, these weeks, we, I'm also very, very impressed of what's going on in Sweden, coming from Denmark. But, but today, I'll be talking about something completely different. We're talking about agriculture in, the ter in its territorial context. You could say that, uh, that Lee Ann was talking about agriculture in, in the social, family, agro-environmental context. I'll be talking about agriculture in a landscape context, which is a territorial context. Of course, all agricultural production is taking place locally. It's framed by the conditions within a landscape. And this is, uh, this is where I come in and, and I'm interested in. I'm mainly interested in how agricultural landscapes are changing and what role policies are, cha are changing uh, or could change in these processes. And a lot of what I'll be talking about is based on, is you can found in this book from 2010, Globalization and Agricultural Landscapes, which I edited uh, together with Simon Swarfield from New Zealand. And most of the authors are still in a network we call Pathways to Sustainable Agricultural Landscapes from all over developed countries. We'll start with a, with a historic landscape. This is uh, typical. It's in the west, mid, mid part of Denmark, but the soils are good here. So it's a typical East Danish landscape with good soils. And this is in 48. And what you see here is, uh, is a village. You actually see two villages. You see the old medieval village here, and then you see the cooperative village, which was built all over Denmark in the late 19th century when the whole country changed from mainly dairy farming and some degree of beef farming into mixed farming, oh, from mainly grain farming, sorry. In the, in the 18th century up to the end, Denmark was a grain exporting country and also some degree of beef export. But because of the floating in of grain from North America and some degree from Russia, the whole agriculture changed within a 10 year period. The most radical changes ever taken place in the history of Denmark took place in the late 18th century. And that's when this, that's when this cooperative village was built. All the infrastructure which surrounded dairy farming was built, including the binary road system, including more than 10,000 dairy farms. Everything changed at that time. And here in 48, you can still see the main pattern from that time. Since then, a number of land reforms have taken place. There has been four rounds where big estates has been subdivided up into small estates like this one. Small, smallholder farms, which really dominate these landscapes. So within the stables here, you have pigs and, uh, at this time, pigs and cattle. It's a mixed farming, it's a mixed farm landscape. Everything was agriculture here. Everything. There were no commuting. There may have been one car in this village. Maybe the priest had a car, maybe the veterinarian had a car, but everything else. No one else has had a, pri certainly not a private car. So people here were locked in territorially. They couldn't commute to a city to work in, in, in a factory, for instance. So it was agriculture economically and socially. Everybody worked in agriculture or for agriculture. Now we're going to take a look at this landscape, how it looks today. This mixed farm is now a large, or somewhat large, organic dairy farm. Uh, and the village, there is, has come a third village, which is bigger than the two others. There's come, you can say, a suburban village. People who doesn't live in or for agriculture at all, who commute every morning out of the landscape, come in in the evening, they work in cities, they live out here because they want to live in the country. 
But they bought a house here to live in the country, and then they found out they couldn't get out in the country. There were no access, recreational access. And like most Danish uh, villages, uh, they were built in some, they were deliberately thousand years ago built in a short distance for the, from the sea because it was unsafe. When Danish villages became permanent, were, sta were, were permanently settled about 2,000 years ago, they all were afraid of settling al close to the coast. I, I'm sure it's pretty much the same here because the, the Swedish coast must also have been very, very unstable at that time. And when, this, when, when the sea became, when it became safe to, to live close to the village, close to the sea, 400 years later, only a few places in Denmark, they moved the city, the village out to the countryside. So this is three, four kilometers from the countryside, but people don't have access to walk out there, even if they go for a walk every night, or not every night, but often. In 48, no one went for a recreational walk. They walked, all of them walked every day in the fields. Why should they walk at night? So it's changed. So these people, they will ask for recreational walkways. They're also, inter they, they're also interested in improving the life condition generally, the quality of the village and the whole landscape. Because this is where the properties are. They're scared to death of people moving out, of being, of being losers in an out-migration situation where everything is about urbanization and moving to Copenhagen or Aarhus or Stockholm or wherever. So they, will be ever, they are doing act, they're actively doing a lot of things to improve this place as a living place. And this is where we come in because we have worked together with them and this is one of my cases later on. But first I think I would like to ask a simple question. How is this particular farm linked to the rest of the world. You go in and ask the farmer, do you cooperate with your neighbor farmers? He will say, he will most likely he will say no. He may say that I have a cooperation about manure, distribution because he got more manure than he has land, so he may have a cooperation there. But otherwise he will say, no, I don't have any cooperation with my neighbors. His connection to the rest of the world is about, is very vertical. He buys some feedstuff from outside, chemicals, energy, and then he produces milk, and he delivers to Arla Foods, and then he's instantly linked to the world market. He's very efficiently linked up to what you can call space of flows using Manuel Castells, work on network society. Talks about spaces of flows, which describe how the world increasingly is organizing into networks. And how these, how these networks increasingly becomes hierarchical. And in this case, he's linked up to a very efficient and worldwide network within the the, the milk market within the dairy market. And he's an organic farmer, so he's, he's a little fortunate, or he's very fortunate, you could say, in terms of, of market prices at the moment. He's, he's, uh, he's, he's getting good prices. Isle Foods put some of the money to conventional farmers, which he may not think is fair enough. Isle Foods thinks it's very fair. There was a a time when conventional farmers were earning more money than they took some of the money into, into the organic section. So Isle of, Food, Isle of Food will maintain we are cooperative and we somehow stick together. But any, in any case, he's, he's, he's happy for, for being part of a, of a well-functioning, more or less globalized cooperative. Then you can ask the farmer, do you have anything to do with your neighbors? And he will look very strange on you. See, that was just a stupid question. Of course I have a lot to do with my neighbors. My kids are playing with the neighbors' kids. I'm active in the sports a club here. My wife is maybe active in the village hall. I'm, I have a lot to do with my neighbors, he will say. And that's 
something else, that's the space of place. The wife in a Danish context is very, very likely to have a job, an urban job. But she and her husband may think that one major reason why there are farmers out here is because of the local community and the lifestyle, the local, the, the, you can say the rural lifestyle. That, think that people here stick together, they know each other, it's a good place for kids to grow up. Many things which has to do with space of place. And if you want to have an, if you want to see, if you want to analyze local communities or local landscape, it's a very good idea to see how these two spaces are functioning. You may have a landscape where the, the links to the space of flows is extremely efficient very well functioning, but there's no space of place. Then, then it may be quite unsustainable. You may not have a great future as an agricultural landscape because no one or very few wants to live there. Only the ones who are forced to may want to live there. On the other hand, you may also have landscapes which are very cozy and very, very nice and romantic, but the agriculture uh, functioning in the landscape are suffering. They're not, they're not earning an income. They're not making profit. There's no real investments. And this landscape is equally as a rural agricultural landscape an unsustainable landscape. It's not going to survive. So the balance here is very important. And this, is, this balance is the one I'll be talking about and what to do with it. But we're going to continue a little bit with the conceptualizations here. If you look at the policy agendas worldwide and focus on the policies which are affecting the agricultural landscapes, there are two agendas which are important. There are many policy agendas, of course, which are affecting agricultural landscapes, but two of them are particularly important. The market agenda, the market agenda, market policy agenda, and the, the sustainability agenda, which is a broad one, which includes, of course, environmental policy, but also maybe social policies and certainly spatial planning policies. You may even think that part of the energy policy agenda is also linked to the sustainability agenda. And it was actually you can say an unbalanced market policy agenda which triggered the sustainability agenda in the first place with the first real international conference here in Stockholm in 72 about sustainable development. And then the Brundtland report, which is all about integrating social and environmental concerns into the market agenda, into the economic policy agenda. So these two agendas, are affecting the local landscapes. But they are very, very differently functioning. The market policy agenda the last, let's say, 30, 40 years has been centralized and centralized and centralized and centralized. Meaning that there's very little, very little decision making around the market policy agenda which are taking below the national level. There are even very little taking on the national level in the Swedish and Danish UK case. They're taken in Brussels and in within the WTO uh, institution. So they are, have been extremely centralized. And there's no way decision making taking on that level can include concerns for this local reality where everything is going on. There's no way. So the distance here has grown and grown. There is some integration going on here. There is a little more integration going on at this level. And that's it. But they have to integrate down here. The two agendas must integrate here. There's no escape for that. This agenda is different. It's much more equally organized across the scales. But the meeting here is difficult. It's very difficult. 
and it's very difficult to get synergy energy in it. <coughs> this is about space of place. This is mainly down here. And this is space of flows, and they don't correspond. The two different worlds, which has to be linked together in the local scale, they must be linked together. But it's very difficult. That's the problem. That's the problem I'm going to talk about. But first, we, we go back to a, a very famous Swedish geographer, Torsten Hegerstrand, who in one of his later works introduced two concepts, which I'm personally and some colleagues, we are working on that. He was not very clear in working with the concepts. That's even better, because that leaves some room for the rest of us. But he talked about competences. He talked about territorial and spatial competences. He said that if you talk about the landscape, who has the competence, the practical competence, in managing the land, changing the land? That is, of course, the individual landowner farm business, which carry that competence in them as the, as the most important uh, types of agents. Territorial competences, the farmers are the landscape managers, and foresters, of course. And then you have the regulation, the public regulation, which has always been there. As long as you have had policy, you have had regulations of agricultural landscapes. The first Danish laws written was called landscape laws in the 12th century. The ambition was to make one, one law for the whole country when they wrote it down. They couldn't do it. They were too different. They were too different in, in Skåne and in Jutland. So they made five laws, called them landscape laws, because they, it was all about landscape. It was about two things, landscape and heritage. So it was about rights to use the landscape and duties to use the landscape. As the territorial competences, they're still there. They're very different now, of course. Hegerstrand, he didn't, that was a little strange. He didn't introduce uh, a time dimension when he wrote about it. But the time that, that's strange because Hegerstrand, as I'm sure you, most of you know, he was, he was mainly a time geographer. He was interested in time and geography. But he didn't really include the time dimension. But if you do that, you have to add the community. And he doesn't write about the community either. The local community, the village, local groups, the local dairy farm, these communities, they have played an enormously big role in, in making, creating the interface between the two competences mediating, making the two competences working together was a very important part of the historical village. It was also a very historic part of the local dairy farm when they were created. As I said, they also made the binary road system. You need a binary road system when you convert to dairy farming because milk has to be collected every day. So the local community did all these things because they were, they were capable to, because they represented the, the agents with the territorial competences, but also because they were able to work with the public. So they were very good on that. We don't know how this is made. Uh, we don't, this is not, this is, has never been published, this one. And my, some of my colleagues said it's not symmetrical, it's not, and they are absolutely right. It's an interface, and they vary. That's the main point here. And maybe we are coming into a period where this community is playing a bigger role again in establishing the interface. Maybe. We, I, think they, I think we are in, in coming into that. If we think about what kind of, what kind of uh, drivers, what kind of motivations are included here, you can say that 
the motivation for the for the for, for the individual landowner, the individual farm business is self-determination, of course. We're doing this because we think this is good for us. The motivation for the community is co-determination. We're doing this because we're doing this together because we think it's we, we will gain as a whole, we will gain by working together. A very few words about, a very few things about these different concepts. Self-determination, the good is something which is subjective, defined by the individual. Freedom is also very important here. Freedom for, for the individual to develop, to make choices. Co-determination is about equal influence, represent, representational democracy, for instance. It's also about public involvement in common affairs. It's about mutual learning and personal development within the frame of community. Public policy, when we talk about territorial policy, that's about conflict management. It's about regulating conflicts between individuals, all the things around property rights is about that. It's about conflicts between the private and the public interest. It's also about time conflicts between the present generation and the next generation, if we talk about sustainability. And it's certainly also about conflicts between the local and the more regional interests. It's about managing conflicts in society. If you talk about the spatial policy. But it's also about placemaking. It's also about making places better places. We often forget about that. When agriculture expanded, there was a lot of placemaking going on. Improving the landscapes as, as places for agricultural production. It was not about conflict management. It was about improving the conditions for the local economy in agricultural production. It's about drainage, soil improvements, many things. It's placemaking. Placemaking is a hip word in urban planning and has been for 30 years. Placemaking is the word is the is the is the concept they're using when they are renewing cities all over the world with great success. To a degree where people are not moving away from cities, they're moving into cities again, even with kids. It's because placemaking has been has had big victories in urban planning. We need more placemaking out in the rural landscape. We need a lot more about that. It's been far too much about conflict management. We need also conflict management. Expertise, that's the old story. It's back from Max Weber. That's the old one. Instrumental rationality, this is about ends and means. But there's also value rationality. This is about doing the things right. This is about doing the right things. And there, of course, they are also very important. They are always been. Sometimes you you uh, you. Sometimes this is the only one, the only thing people are interested in. Sometimes this is the only thing people are interested in. But both of them are important. Okay. Now we can talk about this triangle here. Now we can say that uh, this is the this is pretty much the landscape. How is it affected by the different types? of decisions. And what is the role of expert and expertise here? Well, this is about local democracy, I would say. The self-determination versus the co-determination aspect. This is pretty much about conflict management. And this is pretty much about placemaking. And maybe we can call that landscape governance. And if, if we can, and if there is something in it, this is also what agriculture and 
the discussion about future agriculture should be concerned with. Last, not this Monday, but last Monday, I heard something which really surprised me. It, I've always, re I've, for many years, I've been reading about the Dutch environmental cooperatives, which were generally started 25 years ago by some Dutch farmers who were very unpleased with all the re environmental regulations coming up from Brussels. Said, okay, we will accept the goals you, you state, but we won't accept that you're going to be the one defining how to reach them because you don't know how our local agricultural area is functioning. We know that. And they have been very successful, and they have been big inspirations for the work we are doing. But what I heard the other Monday is not, apparently not very new, that in the Netherlands now they have 40 regional territorial cooperatives established. And now everything is going through these cooperatives. The cooperatives are not public authority. They are not representing the spatial competencies. They are representing the interface between public regulations and farmers' competencies on his own land. So there is a front door. Oh, sorry. There is a front door here where the cooperative is, is, is negotiating with the Dutch uh, 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 government or the Dutch ministries and the commission about the frame, the policy frames. And then there is the back door where they are negotiating with the farmers on the individual agreements. Very, very interesting stuff. Because this is the, this is the interface. This is an example of how you make the two competencies working better together. Now two examples. We can go back to this village we saw first. I will call it an outdated landscape because all the new functions which came into the landscape are not effectively, you can say, supported by the landscape. And we have been able, I have together with colleagues been working in this area. Uh, this, this is uh, some mm, close to 10 years ago we started. And this is, uh, the, for me, has been an enormous eye opener for my research. Um, I'm now doing a lot of action research where we are working together with communities. We are doing it. Our self interest in this is to learn about the process, mainly. We, but we also have something to offer. So we go in and support the processes. And we, uh, we, 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 when we come out, we have uh, hopefully learned something from it. And, uh, and we, can, we, can, uh, we can write about it. We can teach from it. In this particular case, this landscape was one of five communities we worked together with. At that time, we were pretty much working uh, intuitively and not uh, in a very theoretic, within a very theoretical framework. We did a SWOT analysis for the, we, di we didn't, but we, we, we supported the work of uh, SWOT analysis in individual uh, communities. Then we started introducing uh, landscape strategy making in a workshop then we had working groups meeting in individual. Then we had a second uh, workshop where we developed something called, we now call confrontation dialogue. A confrontation dialogue is a dialogue where the local community present their ideas about how should this landscape, this local area develop. And they present it for experts coming from outside. It's not experts coming from the municipal administration. They're not coming from a ministry. They're coming from university world. They don't represent much more than ideas and knowledge. Experts. They're listening to this presentation. And then they present a very quick and dirty uh, 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 plan themselves, which they've made the same day. 
starting in the morning with a brief orientation during breakfast about how this, what, uh, some, some bullets about how the local community are sinking, but they don't see their plan. They get some ideas about the main interest. What are the farmers and other people here thinking about? What would they like in the future? And then they go out in the landscape in the morning and in the afternoon they make a plan and we force them to work together because this is another problem here that agronomists, geographers, landscape planners, foresters, they're not used to working together on solutions. Maybe in the end I will say a little bit about this solution problem. They're not working together on solutions. They used to do that. That disappeared. Now they're forced to. And then they come up and present this plan. And then the local community who has been working with this for one and a half year maybe, all together, they buy some of it. Immediately they say, this is a good idea, this is a good idea, this is a good idea. And then they laugh very much on some of it and say, oh yeah, you can say that, that's because you don't know the place. And then there is a dialogue in a couple of hours, and then the experts, goodbye to the experts, but then the community, they revise their plan. So in this particular case, this is the village you have been seeing on the pictures. Oh, sorry, what's happening here? The village started proposing a lot of different places where they could develop attractive housing. Maybe some of the farmers also wanted to earn a little money about this development. And they were, they were, they come up with, with uh, very wild ideas at, at the coastal zone to make some kind of subdivisions out there. Um, I was saying to the chief planner for municipality who was in charge of this, why don't you tell them that this is waste of time? They will never get the permission to develop out there. And he said, don't you be a little patient, he said to me. They will, they, why don't you just let them discuss that? And they, they discussed it, and they, they had some biking trips on weekends where they, and they ended up, next time we saw these, this is around the existing village, this is close to a, a small uh, harbor there. And I asked her, well, why did you drop this? And then he said, well, we decided, of course, we, we went out and we saw we're going to spoil the whole thing, just because of short term. So they changed it. They came up with uh, with, uh, with first they came up with, with very kind of uh, um, uh, uh, modest uh, suggestions of walking trails, then they became more ambitious, then they talked about the green structure. So this is pretty much what they presented. And then the experts, they came up first with some conceptualization and then a more rough plan where they also, they also suggested that there should be a subdivision up here said this would be an attractive place to build more houses. And then the farmer, there was one farmer who was sitting, listening to this, and then he said, so you should just subdivisions there, he said. The five experts said, yeah, that would be a good idea. That's a northern slope, he said. When, when did you start building houses on northern slopes in Denmark? So there were, f there were five experts sitting there with red ears and uh, and some local experts, local knowledge, of course, which was uh, very fundamental. But, but the idea about the three, the three villages, they bought immediately. They never thought about it. I was a, a geographer who told them that you have three villages. The farmer's wife came out at the night smiling, and I said, why are you smiling? I'm very happy, she said. I thought I was living in villages. Now I've learned in one village, now I've learned I'm living in three villages. But they, 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 they took a lot of it. Um, some ideas about this corridor. And I decided if I have a, a couple of minutes, I'll tell the story about the corridor. Um, they also, the experts presented these corridors some as green ways, so where you could locate a trail and you could also connect some, maybe some habitats, get them connected betterly. 
But they were running two private properties, of course, private, uh, uh, private farms. But nevertheless, this was the whole plan that the local community decided upon. And if you Google Lima, the village of Lima, you'll go into the website and the plan is still there. I hope I have time enough because I want to tell this story here about uh, th these three corridors. Be because uh, the, 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 uh, the local person who was the leading of the, wor the working group, which was basically making this plan, was a local working group. Varied in number over time, over the few years, ten, between 10 and 15 people were involved. The real uh, driving force was the farmer up here who owned this very big pig farm. She, she was really a burning soul, as we say in Danish. She was really working hard on this. So one time we were starting a new process in another part of Denmark, and we invited her and another farmer who has been doing things with, uh, together in the community for the landscape for 10 years. We invited these two up to start the process, the strategy process in another place, to tell about their experiences, about what they have done. For 40, farmer, for 40 people, 20 are farmers and 20 people living in the villages up there, they were listening. She presented all this, daughter did, and they were listening. And when she presented, I, I, I got the feeling that she didn't like the three corridors. So when the, when the questions were finished from the audience, I said to daughter, I have a question, daughter. I got the feeling you don't like the three corridors when you presented. Is that right? She was a little uncomfortable. So, yeah, he said, I, yeah, she said, I, I don't like the three corridors. Uh, it's a... Uh, you know, it's, they're going through private properties. Somewhere they're quite wide. And there are also two or three farmers here who don't like them at all, who say, forget all about these three corridors. We're not gonna, we're not gonna permit this. We're not, we don't see an interest in this. It's not gonna happen. And they said, okay, then I have a question again. If you don't like the corridors, why don't you check them out of your plan? There's no one who has imposed the corridors to you. It's not, a, it's not the municipality who said, we need three corridors there. No, no, it's your plan. Why didn't you take them out of the plan then? And then he, she really was a little nervous. Then he said, well, to tell you the truth, I'm the only one in the local working group who doesn't like the corridors. All the rest like them. Fair enough. So the, the corridors are still there. But then I asked the other guy, the farmer, the other farmer sitting there, who's 10 years of experience in these things. And I said, Nils, would you, what would you recommend here? The local community has suggested three corridors. Some farmers don't like them. Others apparently are quite happy for them. What would you recommend in such a case? Should they take them out of the plan or should they, should they keep them in the plan? Of course, I didn't know what that guy would be saying, but his answer was very obvious, and it came very fast. He said, that's very easy to answer. If the community wants the corridor, they shouldn't take them out of the plan, because then you have one thing is for certain, they're not going to come. If the community wants the three corridors, they should maintain them in their strategy or in their plan. Then there are two tree farmers who are against them, he said. There always is. There always is. Eventually, they will die. <laughs> you know what? The 40 guys at the, at the, at the, in the audience, they all laughed like you did. And from then on, we could talk about private property rights without being religious. From then on, we could talk about cooperation. It, was, it just happened there. All right. In the seminar tomorrow, I'll, I'll talk about the other exam. What came out of this place there? I won't do that now. I'll talk about something else. Because I, I also realize this is about the future of Swedish agriculture. 
In Swedish agriculture, of course, is about food production, fiber production. It's about production. It's about agricultural economics also. So my last five minutes will be about that. This is another, this is another example. It's the same municipality. That's more or less a coincidence. It's the same municipality. It's part of a program we are running at the moment. It's ongoing work here. It's a program called Landscape Futures. There's 12 projects. We call them real life projects, projects which would have been done anyway. We contacted the projects while they were in their births. And we said to them, would you like to participate in an experimental program? Then we will get extra money from outside to support it in terms of professional, in terms of ideas. So we, and we got money outside, from outside, and we are now working on 12 projects. This is, this is the one I personally find most interesting. One reason for that is that this is one of the few ones where we have as a major goal set this, when we finish it here, the conditions for commercial farming should also be improved. It's not only about walking trails, better conditions for rural residents, these better conditions for the, for the space of place. This should also be better conditions for farming and, and agriculture. So that's been, that's been this, this, this goal here, to investigate how interest of commercial agriculture may be included. We didn't know what to do here. We didn't know what, how we should go, how we're going to do this. Because it's not going to be about new reclamations. It's not going to be about new drainage projects or new agricultural land expansion. This is, this is, not, this is unrealistic, and it's also undesirable for a number of ways. It's going to be improving the conditions within the landscape, in, in a sustainable way within the landscape. So we were going to have the first meeting with the municipality discussing how we're going to do this. How on earth are we going to create, start the process? And I was saying to my, I had a PhD student who joined me, and I said to him, what do you think will come out of that meeting? It's a long way, it's eight hours drive, or no, no, it's not, it's six hours drive. And, um, and he said, I don't know, it will be exciting to see, he said, you know, young optimist. He said, I don't think there's going to come anything out of it. Because they wouldn't know what to say to us. And we wouldn't know what to say to them. Why don't we, before we go to the meeting, visit three of the bigger farmers here? And then just ask, would you have 15 minutes to listen to us? And then we say, then when we leave, before we leave, we say, would you, be, would, you be, would you be interested in participating in some evening meetings where we will discuss this? And if they say yes, we have, we have a hope. So we did. We called them up. They're very busy and said, I don't have time to talk to you. Say, 15 minutes you must have. We're coming by. We'll talk to you in 15 minutes. We are out of there. So they did, all three of them. And they all were saying, OK, let's give it a try. We said that we're going to have three meetings. And if it's a waste of time, we will stop after two meetings. This is how we started. And all the rest of it is about space of place. It's about making this landscape a better place. It's a, it's a, this is more Western than the other. You see the Heathland that has been waste. Uh, uh, vast areas of Eastland, the soils are not extremely good. There are some moraine soils. They are mainly old moraines or sandy, but, but it's all right. It's all right. The water capacity in the soils is good enough for, 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 for not, you don't have need to irrigate here. Um, there is quite a lot of protected areas along the coast. Natura 2000, very important salt marshes, some important wetlands. It's a quite a diverse area. We have the biggest plant nursery in the country, a big, uh, very big plant nursery is just part of it. We have the salt marshes along the coast. We have former drained. This is uh, raised land from, from the sea, so this is uh, low. It's actually diked in. It's also pumped out 
So that's a reclaimed area, intensively farmed, very different, very diverse. We held three workshops with the full-time farmers. We, may, we, send a, we send a mail to, to uh, the 20 largest landowners in the area, which are mainly the full-time farmers. And then we said to them, would you, uh, would you like to go to these meetings there? And of these 20, 15 came to the first meeting, 16 came to the second meeting, and 17 came to the third meeting. And we were talking in blindness in the beginning. Of course, we had some presentations, but it took a while, like five minutes, yeah, I'll, be su I'll make sure I'm finished in five minutes. So we were sitting there talking with the farmers. Then on the second meeting, we identified what are the issues we should include in this plan if you're gonna improve your commercial, your production. First, the regional traffic in the area was a real problem. That's, that's, that's gonna be a difficult thing. We haven't given it completely up. Then land, land consolidation, arrondering, some arrondering, better arrondering in Swedish, I think it's called. How you redistribute land if the, uh, if the, if the, if the land distribution is very fragmented, which it is nowadays because the big farms, the ones we are talking with, they have bought up land here and there, so they, it's very fragmented. They use up to 40% of their energy consumption because of a bad arrondering. So that's, that's, there is something to come for here. So no, no doubt, no uh, wonder that this was the third of the priorities. Local traffic to and from the farm, Two villages, very heavy traffic. The, the buildings in the village are not built for heavy traffic. It's a problem. It's a problem for people in the village. It's also a problem for the farmer. Can we improve that? Can we reorganize the road work, the, the local roads? Then to our big surprise, the ones which came up in the force was habitat management. Salt, salt marsh grazing schemes, agri-environmental schemes. We saw that would come very low, it didn't. Participation in wetland and nutrition management projects, local wetlands to improve the nutrition. They were quite interested in that. Afforestation, hedgerows, planting, plantings in the bottom, wildlife management, hunting. I thought hunting would be one of the bigger ones. No, no, no. This is an area where hunting is is quite important. There are red deer in the area. The, the, the hunting right can be rented out for good prices. Uh, and new uh, farm production buildings, I saw that will be a second or third because this is what all the press is writing about, the difficulties to get improvement for new buildings. So we got a little surprised here. Then we made landscape analysis and interview surveys. This is, this is a collection, this is the accumulated results of a question where we ask farmers to, uh, the people in the farm to, to uh, locate their favorite places. And of course there is a lot of overlaps and of course it's concentrated along the coast and a few other places. But now we know exactly where it is. Then we had what we call winter lectures. W the main purpose is to create a common interest for this landscape, a common interest among people. We asked, we had four very nice lectures. And the last one, well, it was about agriculture and landscape. It was about wildlife and habitat, cultural history, settlement history, and so forth. The last lecture, we asked the people, how many of you have participated in, in, in one or more of the former lectures? See there? Almost all of them, 70 people coming, 60 to 70. And then we have, at the moment we're doing workshops, we have done two so far, where we are starting the strategy making process. And this is the areas we should focus on. The green ones are areas where, the, where things are, go, are functioning very well and where protection and improvement 
is, is the two issues. The red ones are represent areas where there are some kind of problems, for instance, by having uh, enough land grazed. So to be done, landscape strategy main Kate carrying out a land consolidation project. And here we are really lucky because we got part of an experimental program running now where there will be a real land consolidation project going on the next three years in the area. We're really, really lucky. Uh, so, and when you're doing land consolidation projects, you can do a lot of things, cheap and efficient, because now that everything is open. You can make recreational access. You can reconsolidate the land. That's the most important part. You can also identify areas for rural housing, rural new housing. You can do a lot of things which is complicated usually, but not in a land consolidation project. It's one paper. One paper and ev everything is automatic after that. Okay, I don't want to. I don't want to use more time on that. I want to use a few. S we ask a question to all. This is from a survey of all owners of land more than five hectares. We ask the question: Do they primarily own this property, as this farm, because it's a good place to live, a good place for production, or is it an equal blend of both motives? Only three choices, no overlaps. What did farmers say? Well, the full-time farmers, they said mainly combinations. The hobby farmers, mostly a great place to live. So this landscape is not only about full-time farming. The hobby farmers own not as much as the full-time farmers, but they own quite a big, big share here. So. They have to work their interests together. This is just about grazing. And here, to our big surprise, the hobby farmers actually graze more la land than full-time farmers. And they also, it's only 11% of the land they own, which is not grazed. And it's 12 for full-time farmers, it's about the same. So it's not like hobby farmers doesn't have access to cattle or grazing, they do. Actually, th this is a hobby interest for them. <clears throat> Land consolidation. I'm finished in two minutes. I'll promise. promise. Yeah. Uh, so this is this is all the plots. This is all the single plots. If we then go to see whether the farm properties, because the farm could own many plots, then we'll see that far most of the land is more than one plot. It's it's not coherent spatially anymore. 200 years ago, they were all coherent. Now, it's very fragmented. Land consolidation will improve everything here, including and especially the land, the, the, the farm production. So no wonder that if you ask the question, if there, were, if there is a land consolidation process going on, will you then participate? In Denmark, you cannot, you cannot, like you can in Germany and Holland, you cannot force a farmer to participate. It's completely voluntarily. In Germany and the Netherlands, it's just 50% who have to say yes, and then they'll make it. But, but that's not the case here. So it's promising. And, and they are interested. They have different interests, of course. This is how we work. This is our interface between the competencies. So we talk about visions, objectives for the landscape's protection and change. We usually have some kind of specific uh, spatial frames. And then we have what we call strategic proje projects. We identify them. Sometimes we develop them. A strategic project is a project which is very likely to be realized or realizable. And it's very likely to contribute to a positive spiral to start a virtuous circle. And we usually have a number of these. This is maybe more important. This is how we work. We're very inspired by Patsy Healy's work on strategic spatial, on, on, on spatial strategy making. But she has, she has almost her whole life been working in urban environments and urban regions. 
but they also work in rural landscapes, her, her, her approaches. So four dimensions, it is about creating attention to the landscape as a whole. That's very important. It's about capturing the situation in a good way, not only to talk about where we want to go, but also where we are. Not only to agree on where would we like to happen, but also do we agree on what the current problems are? And you cannot talk about where we are without talking about where we came from. So there's also this part of it. Mobilizing resources, including knowledge resources and ideas, and framing the strategy. This is how we work. So concluding here, competition of, of land between commercial farming and hobby farming is an overlooked problem for seen from an agricultural point of view. It's almost non-existing in the debate. A lot of land is taken over by hobby farmers. A lot of land is going out of agricultural production or being deactivated because now the land belongs to an urban person who is more interested in horse riding or in hunting or in something else which has nothing to do with production. Is that a problem? It's a problem if we're talking about good farmland. It's a, prob it's a problem if we talk about agricultural land as a limiting resource. It's a good thing if we're talking about maintaining landscape values which full-time farmers would never be able to do because it's not commercially the scale is too high, the scale is too big, it doesn't earn money, enough money from it. But a hobby farmer, so it's a, this, is a, this is a big challenge, this problem. Landscape strategy making inspired from planning theory works. We can say that it works. Including agricultural business inter interest into these processes we think it's possible. We, I'm a little more hesitating, just saying it works. We'll see, we'll, we'll know that some years. But it's, it's possible, I'm sure, and it's also desirable, but it's difficult. Why is it difficult? Oh, I'm taking much, too much time, sorry. <laughs> Research-based in direct involvement in real-life projects is a good way to work as researchers. Tomorrow at the seminar, we'll talk about that. But, but um, this is my presentation. Thanks for your time. <laughs>